Morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to this first Sunday of Advent. One of the things that I enjoy about Advent is it kind of gets us in the spirit of what Christmas is all about. So over the next next four weeks, we're going to be having people come and light the candle and retell us some of the story of Christ's first coming. But the thing, the thought I wanted to kind of begin the service with today was there's a lot of preparation that we do um, to get our homes ready, to get a put, change our wardrobes, and do all the stuff that we normally do to celebrate Christmas, to celebrate Jesus' first coming. But I think it ought to be a reminder to us that just as he came the first time, he's going to come again. So as you prepare yourself to celebrate Christmas, to celebrate the coming of Jesus, to celebrate with, with family and friends, think about how he wants to prepare us, how he wants to prepare you for his second coming, what he wants to do in your life in these next four weeks. Invite him to come in and do, to do some work in your heart and life as you do the work around your home, as you do the work to try to coordinate schedules and all those things. Make sure that you take time to be with him. And a passage that I would encourage you to consider meditating on is Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Al Almighty Father, Everlasting, excuse me, <laughs> lost my train of thought, the Prince of Peace. And as we meditate on that, as we think about who he is, invite him to rebring that gift to us, that gift that he gave to us however many years ago when you came to know him, and the reminder that he's coming back for you to, to receive you as his gift. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be together here today. Prepare our hearts and minds to worship you with everything that we have and everything that we do and everything that we are. Because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wake up. This is no time to sleep. The night is almost gone. Salvation is on the way. Take off your dark days as if they were dirty clothes and put on the shiny army of right living. We belong to the day. We must live decent lives for everyone to see. Don't participate in crazy behavior or in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, get yourself dressed with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't even think about how to indulge yourself with anything evil. There is no time for any of that. When will it happen? When will Jesus come back? It feels like we've been waiting forever. I don't know. Nobody knows when he's going to come. Not the angels. Not even Jesus. Only God the Father knows. But we still need to get ready. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. People were enjoying parties and feasts and weddings right up until the end. Then the flood swept them away. That is how it will be when Jesus returns. So wake up. Keep watch. We don't know what day is coming. Just like you never know when a burglar might break into your house. Set your alarms. Get the house ready. The Son of Man will come when least expected. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship, giving thanks to God for all he has done. And that is what we have been waiting for. The Lord, will make, the Lord will make peace between nations and settle our disputes. We will hammer swords into plows and spears into useful tools. Nation will no longer fight against nation or train for war anymore. He will teach us his ways, and we will walk in the path he makes for us. So let us come walk in the light of the Lord, for in his light we shall see light.
be with all of you. This morning we're going to talk about the subject uh, in with, you know, talking, if you go to church, it's, it's kind of fun, you know. Um, I, I think when, when people come to church, they, they often think, uh, well, let's see now. I, I've, ne I've, I've never, in fact, for people who've never been to church, they come and they say, if I'm going to go to church, I, I think someone probably will, I, I, I won't be surprised if someone prays. Because I think in church, most people would pray. And then uh, somebody says, yeah, and there'll probably be a sermon. Now, this is, again, from people who maybe don't attend church. And, and somebody's going to sing, probably. You know, we're probably going to have to sing a little, you know. <clears throat> but then they're probably going to take an offering, too, you know. So before we go to church, we, we better, why don't we leave our wallet home, you know. And, and whatever you do, don't sign any pledge cards. So far, I think there are certain expectations. But today, I want to talk about not so much about money. I guess that's involved with the talk, but I want to talk about the subject of generosity. Now, if we have the slides there, fellas, uh, we want to talk about the generosity today is really a product of thankfulness. In fact, Webster kind of has an interesting definition of this, and I think it'll come up on the screen. It's a noun. It's the quality of being kind and generous, as in I was overwhelmed by the generosity of friends and neighbors. It's also the quality or fact of being plentiful or large, like uh, dinners or diners certainly cannot complain about the generosity of portions. Uh, while in Germany on my travels, I uh, was at a, uh, a restaurant called Triple XL. That's the name of the restaurant, Triple XL. And if so, you're not, you've been to one of those, have you? Have you okay. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, if you ever go, you'll never forget it. Uh, the baked potatoes are about the size of your left leg. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's just immense proportions. You can order one meal and four people can share it. It's amazing. Definitely generous on the portions. In fact, I would say, I put up a little motto here, you can see it. It's called Generosity Changes Everything. It really does. Uh, Ellen White, who was a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm not quoting because I believe in that, but I'm just saying even she stumbled onto this and says, true generosity is too frequently eaten up by prosperity and riches. That's an interesting twist, isn't it? Christopher Hitchens, the great uh, the atheist from England who was very vitriolic about his atheism, said, the great thing about the United States and the historically magnetic effect it has had on a lot of people like me is its generosity, to put it simply. Somewhere along the line, this atheist picked up that the American people were generous. This morning, I want to talk about stuff. How much time goes into managing stuff? A lot of time does, doesn't it? <laughs> we inherit stuff. We stack stuff. We polish stuff, we brag about our stuff, we earn stuff, we measure stuff, we collect stuff, we wear stuff, we even pedal stuff. Now, I don't want you to feel bad about stuff. Everybody's got stuff. So kind of put the guilt deflectors down, okay? This is not going to try to make you feel bad about your stuff today. Everybody has stuff. The Bible just says one thing, it's just not yours. Romans 11.36 says, For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory, all glory to him forever. Through him forever and ever and for him always. I want to put up a little slide here today. Now, I got this illustration from Max Lucado. I want to give him complete credit on this. This is a great illustration, but I had to borrow it because I wanted to show you this morning. Here's a bunch of stuff. You know? Unbelievable stuff there. We got a little feedback today? Yeah, we're getting feedback. Okay. But let's take a look at this, uh, this generosity here as well. I think we can see there's a TV there. If you want to put that stuff up there. Yeah, television. And I think, what's next? A screen. There's a screen. And then I think there's a blender. And there's a mouse. And then further down, I think there's some other stuff there too. If you want to click that. Another right click there is a camera down below there, and there's a phone. All of that is stuff. Now, the real 
whole thing about this is is uh, this this whole issue is well you got to decide whether this is going to be mine or thine. So I think we have a little clip for you this morning that kind of shows that a little bit. Let's let's take a look. We, we're either going to have it. It's either going to be mine or thine. Now, I know that's an old English word, thine, but it rhymes with mine, and we'll, and we'll just kind of look at that. So so take a look at the clip here. Crank that sound up real high too, if we would. You want to back it? Let's go back and try it over again, shall we? Okay, let's try it again. In fact, stay on that slide for just a moment before you go. I, I, I think this is a kind of a thing that we're going to have to do if we talk about mine or thine. We have to talk about whether it's meism or theism. And, and all this stuff that I own, whether it's my car, my home, my uh, vacation home, or, or whatever it is, my clothes, everything that I have, is it really mine or is it thine? This little clip from Finding Nemo might illustrate that. Let's take a look now, see if that helps. I don't have to pay my debts. I can just put it on the card. 
because really it's all about me. And it's not. That's the Surgeon General's warning here. Now let's go to that verse on 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse 17. This is interesting, and I think it's really important. It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. What a great verse. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they'll be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. Max Lucado went on to say in this illustration, he said, my daughter, when she was young, I took her to the Texas State Fair. <laughs> what kid doesn't like to go to the fair? And as, at six years old, she found her deal, her ride or her, her game. And it was that place where the kids can jump into a bunch of plastic balls and not get hurt. And this kid just went crazy. Her eyes lit up as big as silver dollars, and she jumped in there and came up with two armloads of balls. And she said what? Mine. No, you, you, you saw that then. Okay. That's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And she had so many balls she couldn't even move. And, and Max said, he said, I don't think I was a bad dad or a bad father, he said. But I turned to her and I said, honey, those balls don't belong to you. They're not yours. And, and you could just see her give one more shot and say what? Mine. And finally, he said, I wasn't trying to be bad to her. He said, I just wanted her to be able to get out of the cage and walk again. He said, then it reminded me of so many things about our lives and all the stuff that we have, and we're holding on to it so tight, and we got so much, we can't even walk in this life. And God is just saying, put it down, it's all that stuff doesn't belong to you. It, 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 it's not yours, it's thine. It all begins with saying, God, it's all yours. Now, the first thing I want to talk about this morning from this, this, this verse is that we need to teach with boldness. It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and to trust in their money. Paul is writing to Timothy here, or to, uh, to, to young Tim, who's a pastor there at Ephesus, and he's saying, Tim, you've got to remind these guys that even though they've got a lot of wealth, you've got to teach them with a sense of boldness. In fact, the, 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 uh, the word teach in the Greek here, and again, seminary can be helpful at times, and, and, and this is one of the times that it is. And you have a kind of an interesting kind of participle that goes into this word teach, which is more of a verb type thing, but it brings out a sense of saying, you know, let them have it. <laughs> now, for those of you who go to the School of Mines or another school, I, I, I met our, one of our young ladies up here today is a chemistry major at, uh, at, at CU, uh, and she sat down with me. I love sitting next to very smart people. Those that hopefully it rubs off. You know? and, 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 and so I was, uh, but the whole thing there was the, the idea of, you know, you're sitting in a university, and oftentimes the professors are uh, very, very good, very knowledgeable, and sometimes you, you remember when you had a professor who, 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 who gently kind of taught you things and then there was parts of the program or the history or the science or whatever you were being taught where they came on like horseradish. They just came on with vigor and they taught with a sense of boldness like you better get this because not only is it going to be on the final but this is something that's going to make a difference in your major and in your life and how you work. That's the kind of impetus that the word teach here has. Really let them have it. So, I'm going to try to do that today. I'm going to try to let you have it. <laughs> Use your money wisely. Remember, you got to say to yourself, like we did in group therapy here this morning, it's not about me. It's not mine. It's thine. And until we get that little phrase down, it becomes very difficult to be generous. I, I long to be 
generous. I think you need to be prepared to be generous. I usually always carry a $100 uh, bill in my money clip. Not because I'm proud or arrogant, but because but I want to be ready to be generous. Now, $100 for me is a lot of money. But that's kind of where I feel generosity has to be for me. Now, you can do whatever you want. Maybe for you, it's a lot more. But every once in a while, I study a situation, and at least once a month, if not more, I try to give $100 to somebody who really needs it. A lot of times, I frequent the same coffee place, same restaurant where I meet people, I watch the wait staff. I watch people who come in. I, I can tell from a, about a couple weeks of noticing people if people really need help. And it is a joy, my beloved friend, to be able to walk over and just hand them something and say, I hope this makes your day a little bit better. One fellow came to me and he, he, he didn't realize what money I gave him. He thought I gave him a one dollar bill. That's okay. About ten minutes later he came back and his tears rolled down. He says, I, he said, Gene, I did not know how much this was. He said, I'm sorry. I took that kind of in a cavalier manner. He said, you have no idea what I'm up against at my rental property. I rent and the electric bill is due at $61.87. I don't have a dime to pay it. This is going towards the electric what in the world prompted you to do that? You could drive a truck through that, couldn't you? <laughs> if you can't witness at that point, you're dead. And I said, Jim, can you, you want to sit down for a minute? I'll, if you've got three minutes, I'll share with you why I did that. I came to the conclusion long ago in my life that what I own, even my money and all my stuff, is not mine. It belongs to God. Settled, something snapped in my mind, and I became more generous. Am I as generous as I'll be next year? I hope not. I hope I'll be more generous next year. But it was the beginning to understand a generous spirit. Now, we are rich. You say, well, why are you coming on so strong with us? We're not rich. Let me tell you, if you've got electricity and you've got running water in your house, you're wealthy. You're wealthier than 90% of the world. You're wealthy people. Don't kid yourself. So I'm still going to come on strong. Here I come, here I come. <laughs> Proverbs 22, chapter, or chapter 22, verse 4 says, True humility and fear of the Lord lead to riches, honor, and a long life. You want to live a couple more years? Fear the Lord. Now, I don't want you to feel bad about your blessings. Remember, take those guilt deflectors and get them down. It's, it's not about you today. It's about him. But that decision's got to be made. And, and also, too, you say, well, are we really prideful people? Because I see you coming on strong. Okay, I'll, I'll admit that I'm wealthy in terms of 90% of the world. I, I am. But it's because sometimes when we get stuff, we also want what? We want more. We talk to people at parties. I was at a party this week for a kind of a pre-Thanksgiving, definitely, th or uh, not a pre-Thanksgiving, pre-Christmas Thanksgiving kind of party. <laughs> and, and we got to talking, you know, everybody's standing around kind of, uh, you know, having eggnog or some cider, and we're talking, and, and, and all of a sudden, here's the way the conversation goes. Oh, so you're moving in a new house. Okay, well, great. How much, what's the, how much square feet? And I knew I was going to preach this message, and I thought to myself, what's that got to do with anything? Well, my, I want to make sure that my house is still bigger than your house. I mean, we even have covenants in homes with a minimum amount of square feet that really send a message that if you're not willing to build a house with that many square feet, you don't belong in where? In our neighborhood. Yeah, that's, that's the spirit that Jesus was talking about. Yeah. How many square feet in your house? Well, you can't be a Baptist then. Nope. 
you better go over there with those Assembly of God people. I think I finally figured that out about the denominations, by the way. I think Baptists were really Assembly of God people who've now learned how to wash. Methodists were really Baptists who got organized. Presbyterians were really Methodists who've learned how to have a book of order. And Episcopalians are really Presbyterians whose investments have turned out well. I, maybe not, maybe not. Just having a little fun. But the thing about it is, is that we can get proud over what we have. Somebody grabbed my wife the other day and, and uh, one of the ladies and wanted to know if the purse she had was a Gucci bag. And, and I, I did. Pastor Len, you'd have been proud of me. I held my tongue. I didn't say a thing. I, what's that got to do with anything? Is that a status symbol that if I have a Gucci bag, all of a sudden I can now feel more important about and better about who I am? It's not mine. It's thine. Until that happens, folks, generosity kind of gets put on hold. That makes sense. <laughs> it always does for me. Because otherwise, I'm going to have to have more square footage. I'm going to have to more, have more Gucci. I'm going to have to have, you know, I, I still remember Billy Graham had one of the best quotes. <laughs> kind of made fun of the whole thing. But he said to a reporter one time, he said, yeah, I know I can buy a $200 suit. He said, he said but I just look better in a $2,000 suit. <laughs> you know, I, I thought to myself, yeah, that's, that, that makes a little light of it at that point. That's exactly why we buy the stuff. And it's all about the stuff. And that we're rich and we're in danger of pride. So, so Paul says, teach with boldness. Tim, tell that church at Ephesus to use their money wisely. And don't come on apologizing for it. Go right with it. Both barrels. Let them know it's not theirs, it's mine. God says. And then he says, later in 17b, he says, trust in confidence. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Randy Elkhorn uh, has an interesting illustration in one of his books. He talks about if, uh, if uh, back in the days of the Civil War, if you held a lot of Confederate currency, and you knew the war was coming to an end, and you knew that sooner or later the Union was going to take over the Confederacy, and all that Confederacy money was going to be worthless, but you had a period of time to turn in your Confederate dollars for Union dollars, you better do it. Because once the defeat comes, your money is worthless. You're going to have to trust in true confidence. You're going to have to put your confidence in something that's real and mighty and powerful. And God says, maybe it's time for you to invest into heaven. Maybe it's time to change the worldly dollars into, into heavenly dollars. And to put some meat into that as well in all of that. It's important that you do that. Invest into heaven. When we are generous and we give of our time and our talent and especially our finances, we're investing into kingdom, something that really matters. But we even don't do that if we think it's mine instead of thine. We have our bank accounts. And someday, folks, that currency will be useless. So you've got some time to invest. Matthew 6, and I think Len preached on this last week, but I just want to remind you of that again. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves, they can't even break in or steal. Wherever your treasure is, 
there the desires of your heart will be also. Wow. Powerful treasures. Sometimes we feel guilty over everything, you know. I, I've never given one of my kids a gift from generosity. I've never heard Rachel or Joseph say to me, Oh, Dad, I'm not worthy. What I hear is, finally. <laughs> Dad finally had a spiritual seizure and came to his senses and got me a gift. But we sometimes, we sometimes have a hard time receiving things. My wife, Carol, would, if she were here, she would tell you that. She has a hard time sometimes receiving a gift from anybody. And part of it is because she feels like she should give something in that. Even when people volunteer to bring over uh, a covered dish and we're, they're going to bring dinner over, Carol will say, oh, I'll, then I'll fix this and that. No, the idea was, Carol, that you shouldn't have to cook. We're just going to bring it all over. It's just hard. And sometimes we need to receive the blessings he gives us. We sang about that this morning, didn't we? We said that every blessing that he pours out will turn back to what? To praise. God, you're so good to me. Jeremiah 32, verse 40 says, And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good for them. I will put a desire in their hearts to worship me and they will never leave me. I will find joy doing good for them and will faithfully and wholeheartedly replant them in this land. Wow. Put your trust in something that you can be confident in. Invest into heaven. Hey, I love investments. We all do. It's not that you shouldn't invest and have be a good steward and take care of your family. All of that is fine. But view it not as mine, but thine. And the generosity will begin to flow. My final point is give with readiness. In verse 18b it says, they should be rich in good works and generous to those in need. Now the generous also has an aorist participle in that, which talks about a future kind of examination which says, in advance, be, be ready to be generous, in other words. Always being ready to share with others. And so he adds a phrase on it, in case you didn't get the word in Greek, you get the word in the phrase. <laughs> and be ready. Are you ready? I'm kind of a sports fan, you know that. And uh, I love what Monday night starts out. It says, are you ready for some football? Well, are you ready the minute you leave this church to be generous? I'm not saying that you have to drop $100 to every guy that's got a cardboard sign on a street corner. I'm saying, look around. View the situation. Maybe wait a week. Check it out. See if someone's in need. Get your, get your antenna up, your ears and your eyes. Get them focused and get them, get them listening. You can pick it up quickly. You can focus on this and check this out. Be ready to be generous. There's people going by us all the time, and, and I think of that old song years ago, look at all the lonely people. We miss them. Traveling a lot through this last decade all over the world, starting these churches, it was, it was amazing to me as I sat in airport after airport after airport after airport and, and viewing kind of in a kind of a very uh, casual manner. There, there was so much time between flights. And, uh, and you'd sit there and you'd, you'd read. I'd have a book. And then one day I just put the book down and began to do what we all do, people watch and notice. And I'm so, so glad I put the book down and watched. I watched single moms trying to, trying to corral three kids.
kids under the age of six. That was something. In an airport, I could have been a little more generous with my time. I could have gotten off my seat. I could have offered help. But I, I excuse myself because I didn't know if she spoke English and she might think I was a crazy man trying to help her. There are so many needs that people can meet if we just want to be generous. It's not your time. It's his time. It's not your resources. It's his resources. It's not your talent and your gift. It's his that he gave to you for the purpose. And spiritual gifts are not to be used on just secular things. They're used to be empowered by the Spirit for spiritual purposes. So we're not just talking about money here. We're talking about time and talent as well. But we should be ready. Now, let's wrap this up. Now, if you, if you have stuff and you want to share it, then I would just say this. Here's four questions that I got from somebody. It's not my original thing, but I thought this was really good. Four good questions, so I'll just share them with you. Number one, if you're gonna get if you're gonna get stuff, here here's four conditions on getting stuff. Okay, in order to be generous, here we go. Number one, are you getting stuff illegally? If you are, stop it. <laughs> okay. If you pass that first question, go to question two. Are you gaining stuff irresponsibly through debt? Irresponsible debt and things. Be careful. Number three, are you gaining stuff without giving to God? Some call it tithing. God calls it, in Malachi 6, robbing me. Now, there's, there's, this is an interesting Hebrew word in, in Malachi. It says, You've been robbing me of my tithes and offerings. Now, what does he mean by that? Because that's important. Now, the, if I go down here to the local 7-Eleven and I pull out a gun and I stick it in the guy's face and I say, give me your money, that's robbery. And what is defined robbery? Robbery means that I'm now handling money that I did not have a right to handle. But there's another word called embezzle. Embezzle means, different than robbery, means Robbery was, I ha I'm handling money I have no right to handle, but embezzle means I'm taking money that I had a right to handle. And the word in Malachi is not really robbery. That's the old King James translation. And King James got it wrong, sorry. It's, why have you embezzled me, is the word in Hebrew. Why have you embezzled me? You had a right to handle this. It's not mine, but it's thine, but I gave it to you as a blessing to handle it, but you've embezzled. You kept it all for your sake. You kept it all for your purposes. You never became generous. You begrudgingly gave me a tithe, and even back then, Moses was instructed to write in the book of Exodus, when he had a chance to seal it forever, one time, here comes the verse, chapter 36, he had... He, he, Here's the opportunity to say, and God demands 10%, but he didn't. In chapter 36, he says, let each man give what is what? Purposed in his own heart. The men of old thought it was a good idea to tithe and give 10%. God never demanded that. God said, give whatever's on your heart. But the men of old said, I think a good place to start is at 10%. Because they didn't want to embezzle God. Embezzling starts so quickly because it's right on the cutting edge of whether you're generous or you're an embezzler. Now get the guilt deflectors down again. But I'm teaching with boldness here this morning. Remember you gave me permission to do that, remember? Well, some of you did. Here's, that's the thing. And I begin to see this for my own life. And I, I remember sitting there in seminary one day and said, wow, I may not be an embezzler, but I, sometimes I sure have that attitude. I'm like that seagull. I'm no different than the kids. I'm no different than my six-year-old grandson. Going, mine, 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 mine. And you didn't get some? <laughs> tough, 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 tough. 
is that really where we want to go with this? Or are we going to witness the people like Christopher Hitchens, an atheist in England who is now deceased, but even then, coming over to America and finding the generous spirit of the people of God may be the very avenue by which atheists come to faith. Folks, this is, this is some really some good stuff here this morning. How we handle, how we think, and how we react about our money, our time, and our talent. Because it really is all about the generous spirit that God puts into our heart. If we get one thing settled, is it mine? Or is it thine? This becomes the real issue. Now, if, you, if you're not gaining stuff illegally and you're not gaining stuff irresponsibly, and you're not embezzling God, then a fourth question might help you define stuff. Am I gaining stuff at the expense of my family? Am I, am I worse than an infidel and not taking care of my family? Well, if you've met all four criteria, give the stuff away. Have fun. Light somebody's life up. We have Pastor Appreciation Month. If we did, we're generous to your pastor here. But we also need to be congregation appreciate here. <laughs> we need to be talking to one another, hearing things. So don't gain stuff illegally. Don't do it irresponsibly. Don't do it without, with cheating God. And don't do it at the expense of your family. But if you get through all those four, have fun. Maybe this afternoon when you go home, put thine on everything. Take a bunch of the sticky notes and write a hundred thines and then take them off and put it on the TV, put it on the fridge, put it on your iPhone, put it on your husband, <laughs> put it on your wife. <laughs> have a ball. Put it on everything. You're a steward. I want to be very clear this morning and really encouraging to you that your identity is not in what you own. I'm glad you got stuff. I hope you get more stuff. I hope God blesses your socks off. I hope he gives you a ton of stuff. But I've always said, even to those who are the wealthiest of my friends, millionaires, in fact, in a couple cases, a couple billionaires, I've said, God gave you that because he trusts you. He gave it to you for a reason, because you're a generous person. That was his ideal from the very beginning. You're somebody special in the eyes of God. You're somebody special in the sense that you were targeted. You were given that opportunity to bless the socks off of people. And in so doing, God is going to bless you. Remember this. As this little poem says, you have a ticket to heaven. No thief can, can take away what you have. You have an eternal home no divorce can break. Every sin of your life has been cast into the sea. Every mistake you have made has been nailed to the tree. Your blood bought and heaven made a child of God forever saved. So be grateful and joyful. And isn't it true? What you don't have is much less than what you do. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Lord, thanks again for this morning. Thank you that generosity comes from you and that we have a choice today of whether it's mine or thine. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. We're going to invite the ushers to come forward as we receive our offering. Um, we are uh, incredibly blessed people and uh, Connie and I just, just love here with you all and feel very blessed for God to have called us to, to be pastors here in this church. So we're grateful and we want to um, 